God's way of getting along. God's way of getting along with each other. The Bible is full of all sorts of great theological truth, but at some point, you and I are going to have to leave the hallowed halls of this church and go out into the world and meet people. How do we get along with them? Before we answer that question, I have a truth for you, and then I'll explain why I'm saying this. The Bible is an amazing collection of God's view on history, His wisdom, His instruction, and His commands. All the inspired Word of God. As you read through the Bible, you're going to find blessings, and you're going to find promises, and you're going to go, oh, look what God's going to do for me, and oh, look what God's going to do for me. And every once in a while, you come to a passage like Colossians 3.18, and it's a command, and the last thing we ever want is to follow a command that is uncomfortable. And the command that is in Colossians 3.18 that nobody likes is, wives, submit to your husbands as it is fitting to the Lord. Uh, that shouldn't be in our Bible because we're free Americans, you see, and, and, and nobody submits to anybody. We can do whatever we want, so why should that be in our Bible? Uh, last year, Christianity Today actually did a survey of 2,500 pastors and said uh, Colossians 3.18 and the sister verse is Ephesians 5.22, which says the same basic thing, and says, uh, in the past five years, have you preached these verses as written to your congregation? Two pastors said they had. Because pastors are scared. Scared of verses like this because all the women will leave their church. When they start preaching like this. Um, so, we're going to take it, and we're going to take it as written, and we're going to figure out uh, how to really apply it to our lives. Because if it is in the Bible, we have to believe it's the Word of God, and God put it there for a reason. And we're not going to just scoot over it. So one day, a newlywed wife came to her newlywed husband, all happy, and says, I have great news for you. Pretty soon, we're going to be three in this house instead of two. The husband started glowing with happiness and kissed his wife and said, oh, darling, I'm the happiest man in the world. And she said, I'm glad you feel that way, because tomorrow morning, my mother moves in with us. <laughs> So it's been said that churches would be perfect if it weren't for the people. We are different. We are different from each other. Uh, the Bible calls Christians a peculiar people, so we're peculiar. And when we bump into each other, either saved or unsaved in the world, we can react in a way that is displeasing to God. And so God sets up three relationships in this passage that we need to look at. The first is families, second is slaves, and the third is work. So you say, well, I don't have a family, or I'm not married, and I'm not a slave, but you do work in <coughs> your way together. And so there's something in here for everybody. One of the first things we have to realize is that in Bible times, this was written 2,000 years ago, uh, women voting in America is much more recent than that. We've made some strides. And so back in the Old Testament specifically, uh, wives had no rights. They were commanded to marry certain people. A lot of marriages were arranged. And they didn't have a say. If they disobeyed their parents or disobeyed their husband, they could be punished by even death. And no magistrate would come to a husband who killed his wife and put him in jail. It was always felt justified back then because women were just slightly above property, unfortunately. But that is the mindset that this is written to. And Christianity is the first religion in the world, ever, ever, ever in the world, that lifted women up and declared them free and responsible and equal to men in God's eyes. It actually says in the New Testament 
There is no male or female in God's sight. When God looks at us, he looks at us as individuals. He doesn't look at men or husbands as superior to women or wives. And Christianity is the first religion to do this, and as a response to that, the other major world religions in the last 150 years have decided to amend their holy writings to give women equality because they realize that in Hinduism, for example, women wouldn't voluntarily become a Hindu because they gave up all their rights that they did as a free person. So we have to understand that when it was said, wives submit to your husbands, you had a situation where wives perhaps didn't love or like or want to be married to this guy. And he had the authority to beat her up and leave her in a ditch if he wanted to, if she disobeyed. And so on one hand, this was written to bring peace and save the lives of women. Consider back in those days when Christianity wasn't all that legal and a wife gets saved and she gets to go home and what does she do? Judge the evil life of her husband? Witness to him and condemn his sin? How does she interact with a husband who may be very anti-Christian because that was the state of the government? To keep peace and to keep her alive, God is saying to submit. And don't necessarily submit in every possible way, but submit in spiritual ways and submit in family ways. And we will talk about that in a moment. A married couple was celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary, and at the party, everybody wanted to know how they managed to stay married for so long in this day and age. The husband responded, when we were first married, we came to an agreement. I would make all the major decisions, and my wife would make all the minor decisions. At which point, the wife took up the tail, and in 60 years of marriage, we have never needed to make a major decision. <laughs> There's a book entitled, What's So Great About America? It's written by a guy who immigrated from India. He came to America for his postgraduate work. He loved it so much, he became a citizen. He did some work in the Bush White House. Uh, just loves America, and he wrote this book, What's So Great About America? And he said, one thing that's so great about America is he came as a single man to America, and he had 150 million women to choose from. And he could pick anyone, and he picked somebody, I believe, from South Dakota, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, southern twang-talking lady. Uh, and they tour together for his book, and he says in the book, he thinks that's great, but his sister, who remained in India, at the age of 10, her parents started to interview other families to pick the family that she would marry into. And they pick somebody with the same social stat standing and pick somebody, some family that had, you know, good solid dreams and financial backing for their son. And when she hit uh, 22 years of age, the arranged marriage took place. And she now has three kids at the time that this book was written. And she tells her brother that she's happy as can be and loves her husband and that may be. But he says, the freedom that you experience in America with who you can marry, and when you get married, you can get married at 18, you can get married at 80, you don't care in America, do it anytime you want. That brings about a freedom that women enjoy to the point of looking at this verse and saying, I will not submit because I freely went into this marriage, we went in as partners. But one way we need to submit, and one way that the Bible makes it clear, is that there is a spiritual hierarchy in the universe. There is spiritual authority levels. For us, it starts with Jesus Christ, then goes to the church, then goes to husbands, then goes to wives. And you may say, well, this isn't fair. I don't like this. Well, that's how God has set it up. God has said Christ is at the top of all the Christians, then the church, then wives, 
than husbands. And so, mostly, 99% of the time, the Bible is talking about spiritual submission, that the husband is supposed to be the one in touch with what is going on in the church and spiritual leadership in the church, and he is supposed to be steering and making changes in the family to make the family more godly. So especially if they have children, they will be raising the children in a godly household. Now if the wife is over here doing Mormonism, and the husband's over here, a good solid Baptist, that makes a problem. And at that, I would say, yes, if you're going to remain married and have peace in that family, the wife needs to submit spiritually, submit in her religion choice to the husband. Now, my wife and I, we have never, in 23 years of marriage, used the word submit, I don't think. If we did, we didn't need to. Um, <laughs> We are partners, and we are a team, and we collude, and we discuss, and we figure things out, and she has some things that she does, and I have some things that I do, and we're happily married. And so you might say, well, can we apply the word submit to Janelle? I don't know. I don't think you need to, because if you're on the same page spiritually, if you're on the same path together that God wants you on, you can be a team and you can be a partner. But for whatever reason, God said it is important that women need to be the ones to submit to the husband's spiritual leadership. And if a woman is not married, then you take this hierarchy and you scratch out husbands, and the women get their spiritual authority directly from the church. Every Christian needs to be involved in a church in some way. That is where the spiritual leadership and the spiritual authority comes from. And whether if you're married or not, single or not, you need to be getting your spiritual leadership from a church. And as I said, today in the West, women are free. And since women can marry whoever they want, if you know a young lady who's not married yet, tell her to be wise and pick a godly man. Uh, don't just marry the first person and then complain that you don't want to submit to him. If in the dating process, you can figure out, yes, I can submit to this person spiritually, then you'll have a much better chance. You see, in other parts of the country, your parents will tell you who to marry. You may not be able to stand them here. You can take as long as you want and date and date and go on the internet and date and do all these things and figure out who you want to marry. Pick somebody that you can spiritually submit to, someone whose religion you agree with. So then, part two, this is a two-sided coin. Husbands are to love their wives. Nowhere in the Bible are wives ever commanded to love their husbands. Theologians have speculated that that's because wives do it naturally and men have to work at it. So God has to command men to do it. I don't know, but husbands need to love their wives. And love in the Bible, love actually has a definition putting someone else's needs above your own. So if I love Janelle, I will put her needs and her wants and her desires before mine. If I only have enough time to do five things in the day, I will do her five things before I do my five things if I love her. And so the question becomes, if you are a wife, are you willing to submit to a husband who puts your needs and interests above his own. That is the type of relationship that God wants us to have. Now, sometimes it goes awry. Women, wives are still supposed to submit, even though husbands may not be lovey-dovey. And husbands are supposed to love, even though wives refuse to submit. But if wives are submitting to husbands' love, 
then that will create a team, a partner. That will create a couple that can work together for the glory of God like no other two people on the face of the earth. And the plan is, and this is how it was way back then, uh, back in Jesus' day, if you didn't have kids, you were demon-possessed. I mean, you were cast out. Uh, today, having kids is optional. We are free in America. We can do strange things. Children, obey your parents. Uh, this is not necessarily a command to the kids because kids didn't read a lot back then, but parents were supposed to be told this and they would tell their kids, uh, obey, and then the rationalization is it pleases God. We have a situation today Santa Rosa High, right down the road, just went below 50% graduation rate. I believe 48% of their starting students graduated uh, in June this last year. And one reason it is believed is that the families that they come from are broken and falling apart, that there's no leadership in the family, there's no discipline in the family, there's no direction in the family. There's nothing for them to go home to, so they get, uh, San Lorenzo High is considered to be a feeder school into the Oakland Richmond gangs. And so gang members come down and they collect them, basically, when they're hanging out on the street, and then they go up to Oakland and never seen again. One reason this happens is because families today are falling apart. Uh, families today are not raising their kids to be respectful, to be obedient. I was listening to a call-in show the other day, and they were talking about massive unemployment. How do we fix it? This one guy called and said that he had a uh, sports equipment distribution business, packaging and distribution. And because during the summer his business was skyrocket, he felt that he could hire 15 uh, people, and he wanted to keep his costs down and to help the economy and such. He wanted to hire students. High school seniors or first year college people. And every single one that came and interviewed said, gave an excuse as to how work had to be a certain way or not. Some would say, well, I can only work for two weeks and then I'm going to the coast for three weeks, but then when I come back, I want my job to still be here. Other people said, well, I can only work until three o'clock in the afternoon because then I have to you know, go home and play video games or do stuff. And he said, out of the 150 people that voluntarily came and interviewed, not one of them said, I will work for you and do whatever you want because that's how employment works. All of them came with conditions. And he said that that's because their parents never taught them responsibility, never taught them a work ethic, never taught them that you have to work hard to be in this type of world. And as these people grow up, it is going to be interesting to see how it all turns out. But if both husband and wife and kids go to church together, pray together, read the Bible together, if the husband is the spiritual head of the family, if the husband loves the wife and loves his kids with the love of Christ, loves them like Christ loved the church and gave himself for us, then you're going to have a godly family and you have a better chance of having godly kids. Uh, there's no guarantees in this world, but if you follow God's plan, you have a better chance of, of having his results. So then Paul says, slaves, work for your heavenly master. Uh, slavery has been in the world as long as people have been in the world. Back in Roman times, the Romans would conquer a country and enslave their whole population and bring them back to Rome and have them do the, the menial work that the Romans didn't want to do. Uh, slaves are gathered through conquest. Slaves are gathered by force, and a slave is anyone that does not have the freedom to change their situation, basically, then you are a slave. Uh, people have said, well, that is, is what work is. 
I'm a slave of my work. Well, that's not really true. We live in an at-will state. Uh, you can, if you're working, quit without a moment's notice. Just don't even have to call your boss. Just stop showing up. Uh, and you will, by the laws of the state of California, be unemployed at that point in the same way your boss can fire you at a moment's notice without any reason. Uh, we have very tenuous employment situations here that is nothing at all akin to slavery. Interestingly, though, we feel that we have advanced. Uh, slavery is outlawed in the, in the Western world. There are very few countries that at a governmental level will hold slaves. Uh, but today, there are more people in slavery than ever before in the history of the world. The, the, the sex slave industry is phenomenal. People are captured off the street and taken to foreign countries. And there are uh, upwards of 25, 26 million slaves, they estimate, in the world today, which is more than ever before. Uh, Paul also says, masters need to treat their slaves fairly because God is their heavenly master. Uh, even in the roughest relationship of slave and master, God believes he can bring some grace, he can bring some justice. And the third aspect of relationship is our work. Passage says, whatever you do, work heartily for the Lord. Whatever you do, that is, whatever you do, whether it be a paid job, whether it be a volunteer job, whether it be doing the dishes, working in the yard, running errands, going grocery shopping, whatever you do, you do heartily for the Lord. And the idea here is we stop looking at earthly reward. We stop looking at earthly bosses. And we put God as our ultimate boss and we do all of our work for him and so if you are in school if you are some other job if you're working around the house and god was there as your boss keeping the time card would you work different than your current earthly boss one idea that you can do is can you invite Jesus? Can you actually say, Jesus, I'm going to go do this. I want you to come along and bless it. Can you do that with everything? If you can find some things that you can't do that with, maybe you'd be a little ashamed to bring Jesus along, uh, then you're not working heartily for the Lord. We need to see if we can invite Jesus along for everything. If we can, we actually have the opportunity of getting the blessings of God in our grocery shopping, in our mowing the lawn, in our doing the dishes. We can actually receive blessings of mercy and grace by including Jesus along for the ride, by bringing him along and showing him what we're doing and asking him to bless us. Uh, it's different way of looking at it than most people who never give God a second thought throughout the day. The idea that is being presented in Colossians 18, 3.18 through 4.1 is that Christians don't, which means do not, do not live for the moment. Um, Christians do not look for immediate gratification. Christians do not do things for results that will only last for a couple hours. Christians live every moment, however, for eternity. If God is our boss, if we are living the way he wants us to live, then we can begin putting away this treasure for eternity that is talked about in the Bible. There will come a time when this church will be empty and all of us will be in the heavenly chorus. And we will look around and we will see Jesus and we will see each other and we will love every minute of it. And we're going to be there for millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years. We're going to be there for all eternity. The more we invest in our 
our 70, 80, 90 years here, that's all going to burn up. If we take every moment and invest it for eternity by doing what God says, by living God's way, by applying God's principles, by showing God to those who are around us in various relationships, then we will be ready already. So when we finally get there, it will seem like so natural and great that we've been practicing for so long down here. We need to do what God says. We need to invite Jesus along. We need to remember that God sees everything that happens. And he will not only reward the Christians, but he says right there that he will punish the wrongdoers, that they will get their just desserts, that our revenge is God's. That's what we're going to look at it. So if things aren't going well, the rest of was a little bit different. Remember that God's going to make it all right before you know it. And the troubles of this life will be a distant memory that you can't even remember because it's so insignificant. Let's pray. Lord God.